you know what it's like to our speaker for today, Sarah Meehan from Access Group, talking, us, talking to us about these five points for creating a great learning culture for engagement and organizational agility. Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Don. Can I just say I am in North London. It is raining. OK, <laughs> so I'm jealous of anyone who has bright skies at the moment. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to come and chat about learning cultures. I thought a, perhaps a good place to start would be to explain who I am. So I'm Sarah Mian. I'm head of learning content at the Access Group. And I'm going to speak a little bit more about who the Access Group are, just in case you're, you're not aware of who we are and what we do. But I sit on the divisional management team of Access Learning, and I help set the strategy for the learning tech, our learning content solution, and our career development solutions. And really what I want you to know about me is I'm a massive learning geek. So I've been in content production and digital learning production for about 20 years now. I bulk whenever I say it's been that long. Um, and I started my career as a television producer, and then I moved into learning media, and then more latterly, learning tech and career development tech. Um, my other big passion that I want you to know about me is that I'm also a psychotherapist. I had my own psychotherapy practice for about 10 years, and I'm really into child development, human development. So you can imagine as we move into this new phase in learning, when we're talking about growth, people growth, growth in the flow of work, I have just jumped right into my wheelhouse. I am loving connecting the dots between human development and learning and learning psychology. And I tell you all of this because you're going to see some of, or you're going to hear some of this come through in my talk today. But also I have a really strong belief about taking a holistic view of people. So it felt really important to me for you to have a holistic view of who I am. So just this is a bit of a snapshot of access and who we are. We are the we have we are the largest UK headquartered software company. We've got about 60,000 customers and about 5,500 employees and we're across commercial and not-for-profit sectors. And what makes us different is that we are multi-sector and so we've got this deep industry knowledge in particular in some verticals such as legal, health and social care, hospitality, to name a few. But we also have these horizontal solutions that cut across multiple sectors. And really, our vision is that everything should be in one place. And our purpose in doing that is that we really believe that this gives you the freedom to do more. And turning to access learning, again, you might not be sure about who we are, but we have such a long and strong pedigree within digital learning. So if you've ever heard of any of these companies on screen, then you've heard of access because they are all part of the access family. We have about, oh gosh, I think it's about 9.3 million users of our digital learning solutions. So our reach is pretty high. And we're really proud to be part of a wider people solution. So we're not just an add-on to an HR solution. We are a full learning solution within a wider people solution. And we provide everything you need to create a truly people-centric organization. So it's completely modular. You can take the bits that you need to take, but it's all there for you to meet your business goals. And how does that all come together? That comes together in Access Workspace. So this is our employee experience platform, and it allows you to have all of your software in one ecosystem, connecting everyone and everything. And it just gives you that ability to personalize your space, which is so important as we move into this hybrid way of working. And it just, it, you know what, it just is a frictionless environment. So you can just work in real time much quicker. Everything is there at your fingertips. So I hope that was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but I hope you've got a sense of who Access are before I launch into our agenda today. So what are we going to cover? What are you going to get out of it? Well, I, I was quite deliberate in my title. I called it a pragmatic guide because, it, as I said, I love learning design. I, I love learning themes. But then I'll talk to L&D teams or I'll talk to customers and they're a bit like, oh, I just want to get people to log on to the LMS. <laughs> I'm just trying to get people engaged with our content. So I'm really keen to keep it practical. I'm going to get you all involved. That's really important to me. 
and we're going to talk about some of the challenges. We're going to talk about where to start, and then I'm going to launch into these five tips, which is what I tell customers and L&D people in order to help them build their learning cultures. So, as I said, I'd like to get you involved. So let's let's go straight into a question. The question is, what are your learning and development challenges? So please do put in the chat, what are your challenges? And I, you can see that I've opened up a big box underneath the question here. And please do share your thoughts in that, where I've said, please share your thoughts here. On the left-hand side, uh, what are your learning and development challenges? It could be personal, but I think we're probably looking at your organizational learning and development challenges. Sarah, while people are typing, I can see that it's getting quite busy in there, which is excellent. I'm just going to ask you, could you move your microphone a little bit further down? We're getting more of those plosives. That's, that's probably going to be it. Yeah, that's fine. That better? Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's good. It wasn't awful. It's just that sometimes uh, on a few P's and so on, it, 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 it hits it. Right. Ian says, finding ooh, finding where the learning is really happening in the organization. I love that. Jennifer, getting people to take the time to read training materials or view the training videos. And I think Jennifer's encapsulating something which I found in my research, which is that people are increasingly both time poor and actually exhausted of doing things online so there's this there's a combination of things a challenge of engagement marissa finding the time same thing monitoring engagement so we've got a couple of people talking about getting people engaged and alexandra saying monitoring it cj is talking about budget issues time relevant learning Matana says, got, got some strong themes coming through here. Barry says the same thing. Perceptions around time are challenges to build a learning culture, says Yvette. Difficult conversations um, uh, and, and the cost of living crisis uh, has expanded the role of the content and contact center into lots of difficult conversations. That's quite specific from Viv, but it's a real challenge. And it, this shows how external circumstances can absolutely affect the role of learning and development. Wow, gosh, there is so, I tell you what, um, but, you, you know, Sarah, I said, you said, how long will it take to do the questions? I said, I'll take typically three minutes to do questions. There's a lot of very rich content here. And we need to, we need to make sure that we honor what people are saying, because there's, there's, people are really sharing stuff that's really important to them here. And I think, I think we've got a combination of themes that I'm seeing. You can tell me if you agree. We've got the engagement issue. We've got specific yeah. things like that issue of contact center people now having new things to deal with. Um, Naja saying training programs might overwhelm employees, which is part of the engagement issue. Uh, Siobhan is saying where well, learning will and won't help. And managers, Terry says, setting the value of learning within teams. And Terry is saying making learning inclusive. So we've got the learning culture thing at an organizational level, making it inclusive. We've got the point about managers being part of the learning culture, making sure that it's permeating throughout the organization. And then down when you've got the people actually doing the learning, how do we ensure that they are excited, energized, and have the time to do it when, quite frankly, most people are exhausted and got too much on their plate? There you are, Sarah. We're going to sort all that out in the next 30 minutes, right? No pressure. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much for getting involved in that. Um, and, you know, a lot of those themes that you're talking about are absolutely what I am hearing from yeah. L&D professionals at mm. the moment. Um, so you're really reflecting some of that. And <laughs> Tell me about to say something. <laughs> Sorry, Terry. Say I would love the magic wand, please. Um, <laughs> I, I think I think it's important to actually to to, to acknowledge Sarah that I, I think a lot of people in learning and development right now are feeling under pressure, quite rightly. And I think the, the, if if nothing else, look at that chat and just understand you're not alone. Now, maybe we don't have easy solutions, but we're all feeling it. Uh, everyone's got the got these issues. Let's work together collaboratively to try and solve it. Sarah, back to you. Absolutely. Um, a great sentiment there. So just to touch on some of those things, because those are absolutely the things that I'm also hearing. I just want to talk about this engagement piece, but I want to go wider. I want to talk about employee engagement full stop, because it's really present in our zeitgeist at the moment. And actually, Gartner talks about this employee expectation to be valued, connected, and development developed. It's absolutely here to stay. So we really need to allow our learning to help us engage our employees. 
And it was interesting because these were the things that when we did our survey, our book boon survey, we found that these were the themes that came out as the top challenges and the obstacles. So this piece around hybrid learning, how are we going to make learning effective in that context? How are we going to keep our employees engaged with the learning? And also this piece about looking after people, mental health and well-being. And our employees are saying they don't have time, and a lot of you reflected that. And I'm going to touch on that later, actually, about this perception of time. And just talking about trying to get people engaged in the content and then feeling like we don't have the organizational support we need. So I'm going to try and tackle some of these issues in what I talk about today with my tips. And, and to go back to what you said, Don, about L&D people feeling the pressure. So definitely, when I talk to clients, when I talk to L&D professionals, they're feeling like there's a sentiment that they've got they can add value to our businesses, but now they're being thrown all of these initiatives to do uh, well-being, DNI, career development, upskilling, and it's a case of where to start. So what I say is I say start at the end. So you have to begin with what you want your outcome to be. And that is why I was really deliberate in my title today. It might have felt a bit lengthy, but I called it um, building a learning culture in order to achieve employee engagement and organization agility. Because really what you need to do is you need to find out what your business need is in order to try and build a learning culture that achieves those business needs. And if you ever doubted whether we could have an impact on those business needs, on employee engagement and organizational agility, I'm just going just gonna to quickly throw in some research and, and the latest benchmarking. And that we know that high impact learning cultures are 10 times more likely to see growth in these critical levers around growth, transformation, productivity and profitability. Um, and that's a great paper to read if you ever want to make that connection. And also, and again, this is one of many surveys that came out, but we know that the top driver at the moment for organizational culture is the opportunity to learn and grow. And actually, if we can satisfy this need for our people, they are more likely to stay in our organizations. So let's move on to our tips then. Let's just go straight into it. Tip one then is to find out what your business's objectives are. So I, I, I used to be a product manager and I'm always, I'm always product managing in some way. And one of the things that we used to always have to do was talk to people and find out what their problems are. Find out what is keeping them up at night. And I really encourage our L&D teams to do the same. Go and talk to your CEO. Go and find out what the business challenges are at the moment. Because if you can begin to connect the dot between the, the dots between learning and your business objectives, then you are going to get more buy-in. You're going to get more organizational support. So whatever those things are, like, and I've just put, I've just put some on screen that I hear quite a lot, especially at the moment around reducing employee attrition or enhancing employee engagement. That's where you start. You find that out and then you work back and you make sure your learning interventions are moving the needle on those things. So you, what you don't do is just start with the learning culture. Always ask, why are you doing this? Sarah, can I just, sorry, sorry to jump in. We hadn't um, arranged that I was gonna do this, but absolutely we need to start with the why. How do you get to it? How do you, how do you uh, who do you ask? And how do you ask the right questions to uncover what people's concerns are, because they may come back with a superficial answer like, oh, my team have got really bad time management. That may be a symptom of something else, like the team's disengaged, they're not motivated, or whatever. Uh, maybe their time management would be perfectly fine if they were happier. So how do, you, how do you go to the right people, ask the right questions, and then drill down to what the actual issues are? So can I make a plea, and, I, and, and actually, funnily enough, this is exactly what I'm about to come on to, can I make a plea for data? 
And, and, and you'll, you might think, well, that's a funny thing because Sarah's talking about being human centered and human centered doesn't always, it's almost seems like a contraindication to being human centered, but I absolutely think the opposite. I think the data is what's going to allow us to kind of be a, an, an investigator and um, unpick some of the issues. I'll give you an example of that. So employee, I, I was talking to one firm where employee attrition seemed to be the problem. And so what we implemented was an exit survey and then the exit survey mm -hmm. was beginning to show that five out of ten people were leaving because of, of not having enough career development. And so once we understood that, we could be, begin to implement a learning intervention that was based around career, career development. And again, the research is telling us that it's almost even enough to have the perception in learning in order to begin to see those, to, to see a, a kind of a move in the needle on that. So once that was implemented, the exit surveys began to show that there was less movement because of that reason. And ultimately, it was a contributing factor to Im reducing employee attrition. That's really fascinating. And you know what? The, the perception is we have high turnover. All right. Then the answer is, well, let's find out more about that. Exit interview tells you where to go next. Love it. Thank you, Sarah. I, I threw that one at you as a curveball. Did a great job answering it. And yes, data. Right. Back to you, Sarah. You've 100% segued me nicely into my next tip, which is about data and finding out what you're going to measure. And like I say, I make a real plea for data at all times. And it's really interesting because, again, this is a biggie. This is something that people are really struggling with at the moment. And the Fosway Digital Learning uh, Reality Survey and, and, and many other sentiment surveys are showing that 80% are only just starting to assess learning impact. And that's really interesting to me because actually we know that have, uh, measuring data using data analytics is one of the key differentiators between low impact and high impact learning cultures. So we know it makes a difference. So I'm going to just, this is like, this is part of a, there's a, a, a learning brochure that I will direct you to at the end. And this kind of is the beginnings of that. So just to talk about baselining. So in that example about employee attrition, you need to know what your baseline is, right? Because how are you going to know what you're going to try and move unless you baseline? And then you need to benchmark because, and, and I really, again, make a plea to look beyond your own department and look into your organization. What does good look like in your organization? And then what does good look like beyond your organization? So use all that industry data. And then you're putting your learning in, in, intervention in place and then you're measuring the change. So whether that's up, whether that's down, whichever way it's going, measure that and then report back. So report back to your C-suite or your senior leaders, because that way they know that you are measuring your return on investment and you're beginning to implement, you are beginning to influence their business objectives. So with that in mind, I want to get you back involved again, because it's so wonderful to hear from you. I'm curious about what learning activity metrics do you use? And to be clear, Sarah, when we're talking about learn, well, let's not lead, let's not lead people too much. But we're talking about <clears throat> if you're measuring something, um, I tell you what, I'm not even going to try to interpret this. I'm going to let people interpret themselves because I can't think of any way of, of expanding on this question without suggesting things. And I'd much rather people people answer it as, as they see fit. And um, by the way, while we're while we are answering this question, very important question from Tyler Galloway. Do I see some Lego people on the windowsill? I think this be, we need some explanation here. Uh, you do. <laughs> These are my daughters. She Fantastic. brought them home with her the other day. There are nothing better. Well, I mean, I, for us, when our kids were young, Lego people, and also, of course, play and build people. Right, let's get back to our learning activity metrics. CJ says feedback forms. Pulse survey. Matt. Tanat says, as well as, I believe, employee engagement survey, right? After course completion, pulses, as Siobhan says, and annual all employee surveys. Um, minimizing error rate, Ella Shiva, if you could tell me more about that, that would be great. E learning forms, learning platform posts. Carol's talking about NPS. NPS is net promoter score. Would you recommend it? Yvette's talking about evaluations, about understanding, remembering. 
feedback forms after training, says Marissa. And Thomas is talking about Moodle tracking. Uh, customer thermometer surveys. Jennifer, can you just clarify for me, are you training the customers uh, or are you looking at the customers to see a reaction to their interaction with the people that you've been training? Terry is talking about a storytelling method, especially useful in social care settings. Fascinating. Um, completion figures. Again, Viv saying net promoter score. Uli's talking about completion figures and feedback. Okay, Jennifer's clarified. It's customer feedback on the training. All right. Deep evidence enriched practice. Terry clarifies the acronym. Uh, so <clears throat> essentially, Sarah, what we have here is a combination of different metrics, all for measuring, as we've asked, learning activity. So it's people's... <coughs> sorry, excuse me, people's reaction to the uh, it's training they've had. Uh, 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 would they recommend it? Uh, plus, as well as that, as well as reaction, it's there's some quizzes. So have people undergone? Have they learned presumably some knowledge? I'm not seeing much about actual skills here, but I may have missed something. Um, minimizing the error rate. Ella Shiva is clarifying initial data collection regarding errors in the business, then measure again after completing the learning intervention. So uh, Ella Shiva is saying it's about trying to measure the impact on behavior of the training. In this case, it's have we managed to reduce the errors of people involved in the business? So a combination there of reaction, uh, knowledge learning, and <clears throat> in a couple of places, impact. Sarah, is that what you're expecting? Do you know, absolutely. Funnily enough, I'm going to move on to my next slide because it really mirrors actually what we found the top five learning metrics were for within our book boon survey. I just, I sorry, just, Sarah, I just, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone for the feedback they put in there. There's a lot of really useful stuff there. I want to give people a chance to read it before I change to our next layout and we get the slides being bigger again. So a lot of stuff there. Um, I tell you what, Sarah, there's, there's really powerful stuff here. I'm going to share the content with you afterwards so that you can go, go back and have a further look at it. And uh, we might get, uh, you might, might get a blog out of it on access so there's more, more information there. Right, sorry, Sarah, back to you. Now, I always find it really fascinating finding out exactly what metrics people are using because this is something that we really do battle with. What are the right metrics, particularly as we move towards this new era of engagement and employee engagement and that being so important. And that really comes up again and again. So when we did our book boon survey, we talked about what were the, the top learning metrics that people used and these were what came up. So what we noticed about this was a move towards engagement. So a real interest in how our people are feeling. Um, and net promoter score or EMPS is a really good way and we, we do a lot of measuring around that. And I'm also curious that we're still using or relying very heavily on things like completed learning hours. And don't get me wrong, that absolutely can be part of the picture. But as we move towards learning that is more efficient, more brain friendly, actually what we're looking to do is reduce the number of learning hours and just make it more and more valuable. And so I'm, I'm curious about where this is going to go in the next few years and what kind of robust metrics we're going to begin to use in order to measure engagement. Thank you so much. That was so interesting and I really can't wait to go through all of those. So now I'm going to move us on to tip three. And this tip is very much around diversifying your learning. And again, this was something that comes up time and time again, kind of a struggle to go beyond formal learning. And 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 when what I hear from people is that when it comes to compliance, when it comes to compliance, we've nailed it, right? We're having really effective compliance strategies and we're seeing that people are really um, completing. They're completing their compliance training and they're really putting that into action. But then when we move beyond that, when we try and take that to other campaigns, and so this particular person was talking about a mental, about a mental health campaign they had, and we try and move that into personal development or onboarding or learning culture, we're realizing that our strategies are not as effective. I tend to do is I tend to begin to, I put this, what I call the spectrum of learning up. And I talk to people a little bit about the different types and approaches to learning. 
So when we're in this formal learning zone, we do, we're, we're organisational led. We are, it's mandatory, you've got to do it. It tends to be quite structured and we're, we're and we're assessing our people. So we really want to make sure, especially if it's compliance, because there's a real risk that if we don't, and there are legs and regs around it, that we're going to experience a problem. And then by its nature, that makes it quite intermittent. It means that we just do it at work. But if we can begin to move into informal and formal, then we're becoming more learner-led. It's, it's more optional, there's more choice. And yes, it is more unstructured and, and we're not tracking and we're not assessing all of our, exactly what our learners are doing. And in fact, one of our platforms is completely incognito. And, and it's funny because at this point, um, people tend to freak out a little bit. It's like, whoa, hang on. I'm not going to be able to see exactly what my learners are doing. I'm not going to be able to follow them precisely through that journey. And that, and that does, that, that removal of control does make people nervous. And what I say is it's about the metrics. So make sure that your metrics change depending on which type of learning you're doing. But also, I say that actually this is where the opportunity lies, this is where the growth lies, and this is where that learn everywhere and continuous learning culture comes into it. And so this is how you are going to get beyond surface impact into deep impact. And so, right, how, you know, how do you do that? It's all very well. Well, this is our approach at Access. So absolutely, managed is a brilliant way to start. So um, an LMS with some great e-learning content. Um, and you know what? If you can get that e-learning content right, if you can make it really human focused, real stories, lots of storytelling, then you are going to ignite a passion for learning. And that platform is highly configurable. It is highly reportable. But then you use that as a jumping off point. That is the point from which you ignite people's passion and then you move them into this more personalized way of learning. And so that for us is our career development platform where you've got skills assessment and you can begin to create these personalized learning journeys based on the area that you need to upskill in. And then we take it one step even wider. And our book boon solution, as I mentioned to you, it's completely incognito. So you can go on there and whatever piques your interest, you can go and, and, and find out, fill your boots. And it allows you to download whatever you want. And it's really interesting because this platform in particular gets exceptionally high engagement rates. We have 40% of people within organizations downloading content from this platform. And this is the biggest circle because really, we're doing this all the time, right? All we're doing, we're learning all the time. All we're doing here is we're just honoring and valuing that. And so this perception of time, and I said I'd talk about that a little bit further. We have this perception that we don't have time. And yet, if it's something that interests me, I will do it, I will make time for it. So I, everyone knows I'm obsessed with TikTok and I will happily sit and learn on TikTok and it doesn't feel like it's a burden. Or because I'm really into learning and learning psychology, I will read a whole paper on that and it doesn't feel like it's taking all of my time because I've ignited my motivation. And so I think really we have to make sure that we are leaning into people's motivation and we really acknowledge the value in the value rather than time spent for people. And, and again, with all this in mind and this passion around informal learning that I have, I'd love to know the kinds of informal learning that you use in your organization. We've got a question from Charles Jennings about, about the, the, the definition of, well, not the definition, but where uh, structured workplace learning fits into this, uh, which we'll discuss at the end. But I'm interested to know when we talk about informal learning, we're defining it in terms of those characteristics that you saw earlier essentially that there's a lack of centralized control and people have more liberty and less tracking would that be fair enough sarah absolutely yeah think okay. of that spectrum and think about the column on the right okay so we're, we're people are typing things will appear in the box um i'm actually interested sarah and i uh, we you 
we didn't discuss the formulation of this question, I think, but I'm when you say what types of informal learning do you use, could you also ask the question, what type of informal learning takes place in your organization? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So it may so it may be something that doesn't occur at the instigation of the learning and development department at all. It's just that there is learning which is happening. Okay, cool. Right, um, Yvette is uh, now. Yvette is saying, I believe Yvette is in the Netherlands. Normally, we'd say water cooler talk, but of course, in the Netherlands, it's coffee machine talk, which I think is splendid. Um, and I think we should all get a coffee machine in our offices so we can talk around it. <clears throat> so, and and essentially, Yvette is talking about informal exchanges, the chats that we have, which are so important. Ian saying, sitting down for a coffee, cake, and a chat. Ian, of course, is in, I believe, Sweden. And, of course, that's a huge thing. Fika or whatever it's called in Sweden, the, the coffee and chat thing. Personal development time, Alexandra says. Huddles, team time. Uh, um, math and that. Digital cohort learning. Now, that's really interesting. Uh, perhaps we can discuss that a bit later on. And then also, math and that is talking about informal mentoring and digital coaching, which we can talk about a bit later on. It, it, you know, the edges start to get a bit blurred between the formal and the informal very exciting and very interesting it's a really good question this lots of really good content coming out of it um well as with all of these people can use stuff in their own time cj points out content that's provided knowledge sharing uh, i'm a huge fan of knowledge sharing jennifer uh, articles briefs etc and uh, it, this looks like it might be generated from the department but of course knowledge sharing takes place generally and terry's saying i would encourage specific YouTubes, documentaries, etc. Um, yes. Now, Thomas, I, I like this answer. I'm not sure we do informal training, in quotes. Maybe chats online. I think almost certainly that's what's happening, Thomas, and there'll be other stuff happening as well. But it's really interesting uh, way of formulating that. Oh, I like the I want to know post. Carol, could you, could you tell us more about your I want to know post? Locally created content, Barry's talking about. Free e-learning library. And Ian, you, you said, do we use informal learning or enable it, or do we just observe that it happens? That was my point talking to Sarah at the beginning. I think the answer from Sarah's point of view is, look, it, it, it always happens. So hopefully we enable it, we remove friction from it, but actually it's going to happen anyway. And what I think we're all interested in knowing is where does it happen and how does it happen? And, and I think the first two answers are your answer and Yvette's answer, focusing on the social nature of people having a chat over a, a coffee, very much part of it. Uh, now, uh, Juan has also answered in the in the general chat. Webinars answered, organised by the enterprise. They're not mandatory, so you can organise them. You can set up, and you can go and learn from them. Okay. Thomas has got a really interesting point here. We're all remote, and this is coming back to this business of a co having a coffee and a chat. And Jennifer agrees with him. We're all remote. So it's difficult to chat these days. All online meetings have a purpose. It's difficult to organize those online or those organic chats. Jennifer agrees. And I do think people have been feeling that. Sarah, is that your observation in organizations that that part of informal learning hasn't been removed, but perhaps you need to find ways of instigating it? Sarah. Uh, uh Absolutely. And this really kind of hooks into everything I'm passionate about, which mm. is people learn from people mm. um, and the importance of those conversations, mm. of storytelling, all the things that we know kind of make us human almost. And, and I'm going to come on to that in a minute. Um, but some of those points around, um, yes, do, do, do we, we use or do we actually facilitate and enable it? Absolutely, we facilitate and enable it and honour and validate it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. see it as valuable. And, and as organisations, we've been guilty of not always doing it, almost thinking if it's not on an LMS and we're not tracking it, then it's not meaningful. And mm -hmm. so there really is a piece now around how do we, honor that and how do we encourage people to bring it back into the organization I'm I'm a big, sorry go on, go on, go on, i was gonna say on. i'm a big fan of that saying the knowledge is in the room and i think you said that yeah. at the top don i did about actually that everything we need to know is right here in this room we mm. just have to find ways to share and learn from each other yeah i think i didn't say the knowledge is in the room my my phrase is although it's, it's equally applicable 
the answer is in the room, which is what you're saying. I think, you know, yeah. we've got, and I believe that firmly about the LD community, that we can support each other to the answers here. Yvette is saying we can have water cooler talks or coffee machine talks also on chat. And it is possible to do it. You can get people together online for the for these casual conversations, but it does have to be deliberately set up in a way that doing it, um, well, it doesn't always have to be deliberately set up, but typically it has to be deliberately set up in a way that doing it uh, informally, casually bumping into people is what naturally happens in the office. Uh, Barry says, we've got a public team in Teams, Microsoft Teams, dedicated to pulling in knowledge from across the organization and tip sharing. And I do think, Sarah, we're increasingly seeing a shift, well, what you're describing, the acceptance that informal learning is a huge part, information sharing, a huge part of how this happens. Alexandra says, Yam Teams, these are all tools you can use. And it needs to be fostered, encouraged, supported, and where possible, curated, but that's not always necessary. Sometimes the role of L&D is really just to provide the mechanism and the support for people to do it. And <clears throat> Elishiva, if you could put something in the general chat, I would love to know more about how you how you've replaced or supported the informal chats which were taking place face to face with a group chat, which I'm guessing is happening online. Elishiva, if you can tell us more about that, I would love to. Uli has a, f a formal hippocampus where we share learnings. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, there's so much going on in that chat. Listen, we're going to, I know that Sarah's got more slides to get through. Um, I'm going to ask you, um, if you're still typing in that box, if you could either type it in the general chat or wrap up quickly, and then we'll move on. I can see Elishiva and uh, Matanat are still are still typing. Um, would love to know more, Uli is saying, by the way, in the general chat, about whether you recognize the quality of learning materials. Let's talk about that at the end. It probably does have a role to play, doesn't it? Uh, it's, and now look, Matanat has raised a really important point here. It's critical that people feel, people feel safe and secure to ask for help, inputs, and share. I suspect that with your psychotherapy background, Sarah, you are going to dwell on this either now or ask your question about it at the end. But we can't have that feeling of collaborative learning culture if we don't feel safe. Let's talk about that at the end. Ah, now, look, Jennifer said, we did the same as Viv, setting up these things. We found that people stopped coming due to more important tasks to be done. Such an important point. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring those two both into the questions that we have at the end. Thank you so much. Um, let's keep going, Sarah. I, we're building up a great, a great reservoir of stuff to talk about in a couple of minutes' time. So, yeah, some really interesting issues coming out there. Really looking forward to chatting later. Um, and just in case there was ever any doubt, although it sounds like you all acknowledge that self-determined learning absolutely has an impact on our business leaders. So well-being, DNI, retention, productivity, ability, agility, it really does move the needle on these things. So let's race on to tip four. And it's really interesting because actually what you all talked about there, it really leads me beautifully onto tip four, which is empowering your people. And this is a this is the key to stop L&D teams feeling that pressure. Take the reins off, step back and let your people lead when it comes to learning. And absolutely, scalable learning tech is the backbone. It cannot happen without that learning tech. And digital solutions alone do not build these learning cultures. And what we were just talking about, you know, building things like psychological safety, you know, that, that, that's built by people, not by our tech. So people are absolutely the key to this equation. And of course, I was, of course, I was going to do a bit of human development theory. Um, so what we know about humans, about human development, is that they are self-actualizing, so Maslow talks about a hierarchy of need, but self-actualizing is actually that we move towards the light. We always want to grow. They're relational. So Stern talks about from the moment you are born, you want to be in relationship. 
In fact, the way that human brains grow is in relationship. So we are relationship seeking. And also, Pangsep, who is a, a effective neuroscientist, talks about these primal emotional motivational systems. And one of the most important one is the seeking system. And the seeking system means that we in, are intrinsically curious and we will always drive towards something. So just think about the power in your people. And what you're actually doing is you are just facilitating and enabling that. And you are trying not to squash that light within people. And so what you need to do is you need to lean into their motivation. So at the moment, we know that personal development is absolutely the reason why people learn. So if we can lean into personal development, career development, then we are going to unleash all of this engagement and all of this drive. And, you know, this piece about keeping, keeping connected and you talk about those water cooler moments. And I'm, I'm nodding rig rigorously because absolutely it is that we need to have these connections because being connected is inherently human and we will always drive ourselves towards being connected to people. And this is why you're seeing a rise in social learning. And so, and, and the Global Sentiment Survey, shout out to Dawn, is absolutely showing this. And also virtual, virtual classrooms is seeing a massive rise at the moment. So we can't necessarily do classroom face-to-face -face anymore, but these virtual classrooms where people can learn together is absolutely on the rise. So here what we do is we say we acknowledge that and we really try and bring the social into our learning. So Access Engage is our social networking tool and you can post your learning on there. You can start conversations. The whole organization can rally around a particular piece of learning or content. Or it doesn't even have to be content. It can just be a conversation that you all rally behind and learn something about. I'm going to move into tip five and then we'll conclude and we can have our chat, which I'm really excited about. My last tip for you is about integrating your learning. So integrate your learning solution into your wider people solution. And this is really at the heart of being human centered, because if we're going to take this holistic view of people, we've got to start with the person. We don't start with the system, we start with the person and then we enable them by having all of the technology around them. So everything needs to be in one place. And it's really interesting because what you're doing when you do this is that you are showing you care. You are showing that you care about their time and that you want them to have a frictionless environment to operate in. And that really reduces the stress and the burden of any of the workflow. And at the same time, you're achieving your business objectives, right? So you're making things more efficient and, and people can be more productive. And just, and I'm, I'm shouting out again to Don because this L&D perspective grid that um, I saw the other day on LinkedIn and I imagine Don's gonna put it in the chat, is just about looking beyond so looking beyond, if we're going to take a holistic view of the person, we need to take a holistic view of our organization and the wider industry. So go and have a chat with your colleagues, your, your employee success colleagues. Go and talk to HR, go and talk to recruitment, go and talk to pay, go and talk to your business leaders. And then you can get a holistic view of what we're trying to achieve. And then if we all galvanize behind one business imperative, then we are surely going to have a bigger impact. Actually, what you're doing here, you join all those systems up and you're going to drive that engagement. So I'm, I'm checking how much holiday I've got left and I'm noticing that someone's having a conversation or I'm noticing a piece of learning or I'm able to see exactly um, what, what the latest content is that's trending and what people care about. So really, this is a great way to drive up engagement and engagement was one of our challenges. It's always one of our challenges. And just this thing about data and a plea to data and for our L&D teams trying to get all of that data together, 
if you've got all your data from all your systems in one place, imagine how powerful that will be. Imagine the holistic view that you can have of your people if all of the data about them is in one place. Imagine the picture you could build up about what our people care about. Okay, that's it. Those are my five tips. I put them on screen so you can think about perhaps what you're doing within your organization and whether you could build in some of these practices into what you're doing. Um, I, I hope I've come in on time, Don. Um, it's been wonderful to talk to you all. I will say thank you so much. There is a brochure, a landscape of learning brochure, that is really interesting and help you work out how to put your people, uh, your career, careers development at the heart of your people, and then also access all areas. And I put 16th of November, because that's the time that I'm doing my session, and we have a whole agenda of sessions around the talent suite. So if you want to know more, please sign up for that. It does last more than one day, doesn't it? It's a, it's a few days. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. It's, it, it's, it's a two-week schedule, but our Talent Suite Day is the 16th. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. That's the only bit that's important. Sarah, thank you so much. Loads of, loads of great content there. And we had people asking, hang on a second, Don, can you just confirm this is being recorded, isn't it? Because I need to go back and watch it again. So thank you so much. Great content there. Downloads on the left-hand side. I'm just going to drop in also the um, the link to the book boon uh, learning uh, point in the uh, in the references on the resources there. Thank you so much. Loads of stuff to ask you. Excuse me, I've got a cough. I'm going to start with Charles Jennings' question. We put in right at the end, um, but we've got, I've got I've, I've collected things while people have been speaking. But Charles Jennings' point at the end, I think, is a really important one. The link between engagement and performance. There's lots of suggestions that engagement is linked to a whole bunch of things. I'm summarizing you, Charles, coarsely. Um, but the question is, is there a strong link between engagement and performance? High performers are more engaged employees, but high engaged employees are not necessarily high, high performance, if that makes sense. Um, do we have any ideas uh, around this issue? Um, and and if not, you know, that's fine. But you know, it, it's something worth exploring. I think um, it's it's interesting because I did actually read some research that um, the top performers in the organisation, and I and I will get the link to you. The top performers in the organisation are um, absolutely the most satisfied. And there is there is a link between performance and engagement. And actually, the strongest learn, learning cultures. Um, keep, have performance and use performance metrics at all time. Oh, I can't hear you, Dom. <clears throat> okay, I confess I was on mute. All right, let's get that, let's get that out of the way. Uh, your microphone has moved up a bit. Could you move oh, it down? There we go. Sorry. That's all right. That's all right. Um, I think that's probably, yeah, I've just had somebody shout at me in the background. Don, you're on mute. Okay, I'm back. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, Charles. I, it is it is complex, and we definitely need to be aware that engagement is not the same as learning. It's not the same as performance. Uh, if nothing else, we need to um, have that. Siobhan, um, if you could, if you could, if you've got any links or anything, that would be great. Let's jump into another question from Charles, just because it's the top of my list here. You had your list of formal and informal. What about the stuff that is structured workplace learning? And some of that was touched on when you asked the question about what informal stuff you're doing uh, like team reflective practice or stretch experiences so you have you give somebody something to do or you have an activity which is geared towards learning but it's not formal learning in the sense that it is highly structured and mandatory which is usually the two characteristics we have for formal learning so whereabouts would structured workplace learning to use charles's term fit into your mapping your your spectrum is it somewhere in the middle so yeah then i would say we're moving because what norm formal is is it's kind of like um it's it's the jumping off point from formal so it doesn't have to be as highly structured but there is an element that there is some structure around it and that we are kind of reaching for something in particular so then that kind of moves us more into a non-formal so not completely just go and go and do exactly as you want completely interest-led there is some structure so i'd put that in non-formal and i think you know whatever 
semantic discussion we have around it, it's important to recognize that the the thing that people in the business think is training and is therefore learning, which is you sit in a classroom and somebody talks to you, for adults works in some occasions, but it is not always, in fact, it generally isn't the most effective way of learning for better workplace performance. And so I'm trying to be very careful with my words here. I'm not having a go at the classroom. It just isn't always the right answer. Um, and I suppose the point, Don, is about make, is, is the diversification, right? So yeah. it's about making sure that we use all of those approaches. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and the right ones for the right job. I, I wrote this thing on LinkedIn yesterday because it was 30 years since I'd started at a particular company. And in I can tell you, in 1992, you had two mechanisms. You had a book and you had a classroom. Well, if that's all you've got, then pretty much. If that's all you've got, then that's... Uh, all you can use. We don't have to just use those now. We have a much wider, um, much wider set of tools we can use. Terry Larkin talked about the need to build um, learning on trust, and it was something that came up again and again. Uh, Mathematt said it's critical that people feel safe and secure to ask for help, and so on. And I'd just like to get your thoughts about psychological safety in the workplace and how it's linked to how it's linked to, in particular, informal learning for want of a better word, in the sense that if people are learning socially from each other or in any other way from each other and they need to ask questions and have them answered sensibly, how important is trust? How important is that feeling of safety? I mean, psycholog psychological trust will stop in organisations a big thing, but even more so in learning because you're really exposing yourself to yeah. the, you know, the fact that you, you might not know something. Um, Absolutely. And if I talk in terms of human development as well, if we if we if we can't build that safe, that safety, that consistent environment where we know we can be whoever we need to be, then we basically we, we stop asking questions and all of that seeking. Um, all of all of that seeking system that we have that I talked mm. about, we actually completely repress and depress that mm. and so actually there's a real danger if you don't create that psychological safety that you're inhibiting people's um, instinctive seeking system which to be honest is something that most organizations traditionally have done because asking questions has been seen as well something you should simply shouldn't do because it challenges the hierarchy so there's well, I, I, sorry, I'm, I'm suggesting that's a fact. Would you agree, Sarah, that most organisations have relied on hierarchy supported by uh, a structure of command and control that suggests people shouldn't ask questions and that is counterproductive when it comes to trying to establish a culture of learning? Um, absolutely. And as you as you have seen, that we're moving towards um, people-centric organisation, co-created learning cultures, mm -hmm. and that is just not possible to um, conduct ourselves in that way anymore, because what's going to happen is that we're going to just see increased employee attrition. And in this skills gap that we're experiencing, this talent shortage, that is that is not an option anymore. So we have to create these psychologically safe environments, these um, this growth mindset, and we have to enable that with our structure and our hierarchy. We'll not even have a hierarchy in that sense anymore. Well, we may need a hierarchy, but the hierarchy has to be based on something other than uh, command and control. Um, Matt and Matt raises a really good point. There's another view on performance and engagement. Top performers do not necessarily share, particularly when individual results are rewarded. I talked recently to an organization, um, in fact, it was a hotel chain, where managers are have explicitly built into their KPIs that they are better rewarded when people underneath them progress up the organization. So if their team members get promoted, they get supported. That's, that's a real practical way of building into a hierarchy a sense that actually learning is crucial and development is crucial um, i'm looking i'm looking here at um the some of the other questions because we've got three minutes left yvette says i agree about psychological safety on the other hand you need to have a sort of uncomfortable feeling to change people change when uncomfortable and grow when challenged i like that very nicely put yvette um so psychological safety can we just clarify sarah it's not sitting around in pink fluffy cardigans feeling comfortable it means that we are comfortable to challenge yeah I, I mean absolutely they're kind of they're not mutually exclusive like you basically have to make sure that you create an environment where um, you can manage uncomfortable feelings and again in child development that's what we do with our children 
we make sure that they can manage uncomfortable feelings. So really, that's what we're trying to do. Can we also have a naughty step at work? Because when I was managing large teams, that would have been really effective, but it might have been seen as too paternalistic. Um, Ian, interestingly, says, I've seen Slido and the ability to ask questions anonymously really open things up. Ditto, Ian. I, I've seen that. Not always comfortable. I remember as a manager uh, receiving some anonymous feedback on 360 and precisely because it was anonymous, I realized what a bad manager I was. It did help me get to be a better manager, but it was really quite stark. Anon anonymity can be incredibly valuable. Siobhan says, moving to a people-centric organization feels very aspirational for some sectors, hence back to building that journey through strong links to how this enables high performance. I, I, I really like this point of Siobhan's. I think perhaps this is where we wrap up, which is saying you can't do it simply because it's the right thing. You can't do it simply because it feels good. The ultimate reason has to be if you build your learning culture, guess what? You have high performance and therefore in the profit sector, shareholder return or in the non-profit sector, you're doing your job better. Uh, Sarah, we, we're at, um, we've got one minute left. Is there anything you'd like to say as we wrap up? Um, just to, to almost it's a great place to end isn't it so that point about linking it back to your yeah. objectives at all times and that being so key go and talk to the people in your business it's where we started wasn't it and i jumped in with that cheeky question how do you ask the question and so on and and i do think that the transition for l d from asking what training people need to what are the business problems we're solving and then asking repeated questions to get to the bottom of that in a polite way is the crucial transformation, the most crucial, crucial transformation of all that learning development needs to do. It's got nothing to do with technology and everything to do with our relationship with the business. Brilliant. Terry, Viv saying thank you very much. It has been a great session. I want to say thank you very much to everyone who – we had a very, very low drop-off rate during that. I think everyone was sitting forward, wanting to catch what was coming. So thank you very much for your contribution, Sarah Meehan of Access Group. Thank you very much for delivering and guiding us through that in a very structured – but also very human way. Please do download the white paper. You can see the links on the left-hand side. Please do get in touch with Sarah uh, and have a look at all those other links on the left-hand side. Thank you so much. Right, I'm going to put people into a sort of holding session. Don't go away, Sarah. I just want to say thank you very much personally. And yes, by all means, of course, you will get the recording uh, in a mail to you tomorrow morning. Thanks very much and bye for now. Sarah, do you want to say goodbye? Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>